Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech for the 11 o'clock block. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about community matters, but the community we're talking about is not necessarily Oahu. Um, it's Kauai. And we have the uh, prosecuting attorney for Kauai, Justin Kolar, on with us. Thank you very much for joining us today, Justin. Thank you, Jay. It's an honor to be here. Aloha to everyone watching and listening out there. Um, thanks for tuning in and, and showing interest in your community. And, and thanks to everyone making the show happen. Really appreciate it. Amen. Wish I'd said that. <laughs> so you're, you're running for office uh, for the November election coming soon. Um, and this is this would be what your third term. Am I right about that? This uh, this will be my third term in office. I was first elected in 2012. Uh, grateful to be reelected in 2016 and looking forward to continued service to the people of Kauai and Hawaii for years to come. Yeah, and the question is, and you're unopposed, which makes it all the more interesting, you know, in terms of your career. Um, sure. But but why are you running for prosecuting attorney? I mean, some people would say, "Are you kidding?" I would never do that. But you're you like doing it, eh? I'm I'm passionate about the safety of my community. I am passionate about the health of my community, and I'm passionate about service. I um, came to Hawaii in 2006, and have been working. Uh, in public service ever since then. And uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to live and work in such a, a special, incredible place like Kauai. I mean, uh, when I was when I was young, growing up, uh, wondering where life would take me, I certainly had no idea that I would uh, get to do such meaningful work in such a beautiful place um, in a community filled with such caring people. So I'm, I'm a very fortunate guy. Yeah, Kauai's a special place. But let's talk about your, your training and your career and uh, your qualifications for the office in general. Sure. I, um, I graduated from Suffolk University Law School in Boston in 2004. I worked for the city of Boston in their corporation counsel's office for several years, first as a paralegal, then as an attorney. Uh, represented the city in all sorts of different cases, uh, police misconduct cases, zoning cases, uh, provided uh, ethics opinions and guidance, things of that nature. Uh, clerked in the Massachusetts Superior Court, which was uh, certainly a learning experience for me, working with the judges of the Superior Court in Massachusetts. Um, came to Hawaii in 2006 to serve as a law clerk for Judge Dan Foley, uh, retired from the Intermediate Court of Appeals. And, uh, and one day in 2008, he, he walked into my office and showed me an ad for uh, a position, for a deputy prosecutor position here on Kauai. He said, it's a great place. It's a special place. You can establish yourself and do meaningful work. And uh, fortunately, I, was, I got the job, came over here, um, loved it, uh, developed a passion for it, and saw an opportunity to um, come into the office and make some positive changes in our criminal justice system and uh, was very fortunate to be elected, like I said, in 2012. And, you know, over the past eight years, we've really had the opportunity to put together a, a solid team of uh, attorneys, a victim witness counselors, administrators, investigators, and our, our line staff, uh, clerical staff. So, um, you know, I get to work with 44 other people in my office that uh, are passionate about community safety and share my values and share, um, a sense of mission, and uh, it's it's a great place to work. Yeah, that's great. Um, so uh, you know, I uh, since you're running, although you're unopposed, I think it's fair for you to discuss your platform. What sure. are, what what initiatives are you advancing? What uh, why, what ideals are you uh, ascribing to? Well, I consider myself a progressive prosecutor. I consider myself a reform-minded prosecutor, and um, you know, essentially what we're trying to do is change uh, the mentality of our profession, which, is, you know, in the 80s and 90s was very much a, a tough on crime, lock them all up, throw away the key type of mentality. And, you know, what, what we're seeing now is that, you know, we've succeeded as a country in locking up a larger portion of our uh, community than just about any other country on earth. And it doesn't seem to be making us uh, any safer. So, you know, we, you know, I acknowledge that there are people out there that need to be in jail and in prison and uh, for people who hurt, hurt other people and people that commit uh, serious crimes um, and cannot be safely housed in the community, you know, we're going to continue uh, locking them up. Um, but there's a lot of folks 
who are going to be coming back into the community at some point. You know, 99.9% .9 of the people who get sent to jail are gonna come back into the community. And I think where we've really fallen down as a system is at preparing people to succeed when they do come back into the community. So I'm very focused on using the machinery of the criminal justice system to help increase uh, the beneficial outcomes from a person's involvement in the criminal justice system. Because um, yeah. you know, if we lock somebody up for five years or 10 years, they come back into the community, uh, where's their support system? Where's their opportunity to become a productive member of the community? Where are they gonna work? Are they gonna be able to get a driver's license? Things like that. We wanna make sure we can uh, create a system that, that addresses uh, bad behavior, but also um, corrects uh, it gives people the opportunity to to correct their past mistakes and move on with their lives and escape from whatever pattern of criminality they might be stuck in. Uh, two thoughts come to mind. You know, one is a few well, a year or two ago there was a program on 60 Minutes where they they looked at um, uh, you know punishment in Europe, especially in Germany, which you know historically has been pretty tough on on crime, been pretty tough. Um, but but uh, we found to our interest in that program that in fact, even serious criminals uh, got out, they went on furlough, they were in the community even during their terms. Um, and the whole, uh, you know, the whole direction of the, of the criminal justice system was to re, re, replace them in reinitiate, re, you know, re, re, put them back in the community. I, I don't know the term for that, put them back in the community and it worked. Uh, it worked, and even murderers, you know, were, were out there, um, you know, participating in the community. And uh, they, there was very little, um, uh, you know, re recurrence of the crimes. Um, so what you had is a system that was very tolerant, enlightened, if you will, um, and that worked. And, and, and it was stark contrast with the system in the United States. And it sounds like you, you're more on the European model uh, than some of what we hear on the mainland. Yeah, I mean, the, the Europeans do some things very well, I think, and their, their low recidivism rate, their low overall crime rate, and their low rate of incarceration is something we can learn from. There are, there are other, um, you know, our culture and our society is a little, bit, a little bit different, so we may not be able to adopt, you know, their system and treat it as a straight out of the box solution for what our problems are here in Hawaii. But one thing is sure, and that is um, we cannot afford to keep locking up as many people as we lock up, and the public safety does not benefit from it. If you've got somebody who's um, 65 years old and they committed a crime when they were 25 and they spent 40 years in prison, um, you know, they're, they're, the evidence is very clear that that person is extremely unlikely to pose any public safety threat, especially if they're properly um, supervised and given the tools they need to be able to reintegrate into the community. So, um, you know, getting away from an overly punitive approach is something that is going to um, keep our community safe and also, I think, free up resources that our community needs to be using in other ways. Um, whether that's drug treatment, mental health treatment. You know, we, we've taken a whole swath of the social safety net over the last couple of generations in this country and said, all of these problems are now gonna be the problems of the criminal justice system. And, you know, there's an old saying that when, um, when the only thing you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so we don't have all of the solutions in the criminal justice system to society's problems. So maybe some of those resources can be better spent uh, in other ways. And I think, um, you know, I think that's, it's something that's long past overdue for us to be taking a very serious look at. Well, what do you say to the victims though, you know, who are offended is a, is a, a minimal word for that. Um, they're, they're damaged, they're uh, injured. Absolutely. And I, I sit and um, talk with victims um, of very serious crimes. I work with them every day. Uh, when I was a kid, um, my uncle was murdered by people who were burglarizing his house. I know what it's like to feel that sense of loss and that sense of um, uh, loss of trust in the criminal justice system as a result of that. And, um, you know, we, 
there are people out there who um, I have sent to prison for many, many years who I firmly believe deserve the sentences they received. And, um, you know, but it's also, it's, it's kind of a fallacy to assume that all, all crime victims just want the, um, the defendant to go away to prison for the rest of their life. Some do, uh, some don't. And then there's a whole range of folks who are in between. And people process those kinds of traumas in very different ways. And, you know, throughout my career, I've, I've seen the spectrum of that. And, you know, that's always, that's always part of the equation is considering what, how does the, the victim feel about this case? But it's also part of my job as a prosecutor to explain that almost everyone we put in prison is going to come out one day. So what do we want that to look like when that person comes out? And, um, you know, this is an imperfect system. Uh, the, the conclusion of the case, you may feel very satisfied about the outcome. You may be very disappointed in the outcome. You may feel feelings that you didn't know you were going to feel at the beginning of the case. The criminal process, the criminal justice process is long, it's convoluted, um, and it doesn't always lead to the outcomes that everybody wants. So, you know, it's, it's my job to be very transparent with victims of crime in the community um, about what are the likely outcomes, about what we can do for them uh, as the prosecuting attorney's office and you know what we hope to attain at the close of the case one other uh, element um again you're you're running unopposed but i think it's still important to discuss um the i guess it was a public defender wanted to release um prisoners inmates uh, who were well in uh, Hawaii jails uh, and who might uh, con contract uh, COVID, uh, which is a very humanitarian thing, also good for the community. And uh, you joined in that, you uh, agreed with that and you supported that. Uh, tell me uh, your reasoning and tell me what happened and tell me your position on it right now. Well, the top five uh, infection clusters in the United States are all jails or prisons. Um, the potential for any jail or prison to become a flashpoint for the spread of COVID is very real. And we understood early in the process that um, it was something we were going to need to address. You know, I spend a lot of time talking with um, our judges, the medical staff at the jail, the administrators at the Department of Public Safety. You know, we recognized, um, and we had it a little better here on Kauai because our our population is smaller. Our jail was not as overcrowded. You know, we recognized that um, this was something that we could be part of the process and have a seat at the table, or um, we were going to create a situation where we were going to get left out of the process and the releases were going to happen anyway. Mm. So, you know, when we have a roster at the jail that's that's got 140 names on it, it's very easy for us to go through that list and identify um, who are the individuals on this list who can be safely placed in the community. Um, many of them just temporarily placed in the community until the jail is a safer place to put them. Um, you know, we looked at, um, you know, at the outset of this pandemic, we looked at every place on the island where people gather in large numbers. I mean, that we looked at the Walmarts, the Costco's, the beach parks, all those places. And, you know, one of the last places on the island where we still had mass masses of people gathering on a daily basis, people going in and out of the facility. And that's not just inmates, that's the people who work there. Um, and it was the jail. So we, we talked to the facility staff, we said, what is the number that's going to allow you to practice um, appropriate social distancing, maintain hygiene, enforce quarantines of uh, inmates who may be suspected of being uh, infected. And, you know, we were able to safely get Kauai, Kauai's jail population under that number without jeopardizing the public safety. Um, you know, the, the problem is, you know, now, now everybody's saying, oh, well, there, were, there weren't even any cases there, so you didn't need to do this. But the fact that there weren't any cases there means that what we did succeeded. Uh, not that it was not necessary in the first place. Uh, 
all you need is one case to come out of the jail and it's going to turn into dozens very quickly because the corrections officers are going to bring that uh, virus back to their families. Many of them have very large families and it's going to just mushroom uh, out from there. And we were able to avoid that so far here on Kauai. And we have to be very um, diligent, you know, about remembering that this problem is not over and this problem is not going to be gone anytime soon. And it's sadly very unlikely that there's going to be a magic bullet in the near future that is going to um, enable us to return to life as we knew it in January. You know, this is the new normal and we've got to do our best to keep everybody in the community safe. That includes incarcerated people. That includes people who work in the jails. So, um, you know, leaders have to make difficult decisions and leaders have to do things that may seem politically unpopular. And it's our job to explain to the community uh, why we're doing those things and explain it in a way that is transparent and does not lead to fear mongering or grandstanding. And so, you know, our preference is always to work together with everybody in the courtroom and not just try to walk in there and act like, um, you know, uh, we, we make the decision in every case because we certainly don't. Prosecutors have a ton of power, but so do judges, so do defense attorneys. Uh, you know, so does the Department of Public Safety. So we, we all have to play together nicely in the sandbox if we're going to get good results for our community. You know, uh, hearing you hearing you talk reminds me, uh, in terms of the courage aspect, reminds me of Bernard Carvalho, uh, who I uh, who I, uh, I admired very greatly when he was mayor. Uh, and you must have sat, had time with him because the, your, your terms of office uh, overlapped his term of office as mayor. Uh, what kind of relationship did you have with him? I, I worked with Bernard for 10 years uh, while he was mayor. Um, he came into office, you know, very sh shortly after I came to Kauai, actually, when uh, Brian Baptiste sadly passed away very suddenly. Um, Bernard was elected shortly thereafter. I worked uh, alongside him, uh, both in the prosecutor's office and for three and a half years when I worked in the county attorney's office in his administration. Uh, he's a wonderful man. He's got a, a big heart. He's a hard worker and he is, uh, he's, you're not going to find anyone out there who is more dedicated to their community than Bernard Carvalho Jr. Um, his father sadly just passed away. Uh, a neighbor of mine lived across the street from me. So my heart does go out to the entire Carvalho uh, Ohana and I communicated that to the mayor the other day. But, you know, he's one of those guys I spent 10 years in the trenches with, you know, back in 2008, 2009, when we had furlough Fridays and we would go out and do community service projects on our days off. And we had a lot of opportunities to bond over the years. He's, he's a good man. He's a, he's a courageous man. And uh, I, I gained a lot from working with him. You know, you, um, you spoke of, um, uh, you know, it, it takes a village in terms of dealing out justice in, in, the, in the criminal uh, world. Um, and it strikes me that every island has its own personality. Uh, a lot of people feel that way and want sure it to does. be that way. Yeah. And certainly Kauai has its own personality. People in Oahu, you know, they see Kauai as different than the other neighbor islands, you know. Um, it's the Garden Island. It's very friendly. Uh, Kauai, very lush. Um, very, you know, actually old-fashioned in many ways. Um, people, people have a very positive view of Kauai is a different kind of persona uh, from, you know, all the other islands. But I wonder, you know, could you help me define what Kauai is like as opposed to other islands and what it's like from the point of view of the prosecutor? Sure. Um, you know, and we do have a, a, a fierce sense of independence here on Kauai, the, the unconquered kingdom. Um, and, you know, we're the fifth circuit. We don't have a fourth circuit in Hawaii. They went straight... They, for some reason, we're special and we get to be the fifth circuit, even though there's no fourth. Um, you know, we do have a sense of, of pride in our uniqueness over here. And it's not that we don't have the same problems that other communities have, whether that's in Hawaii or back on the continent. We have a drug problem in the community. We have a domestic violence problem in the community. We have, um, we have a mental health crisis in our community. And one thing that I think the current situation provides for us. Um, I think prior to the pandemic, 
there was a great sense of frustration in the community with with what is happening to our island. I mean, it's changed considerably just in the you know dozen or so years since I've been here. Traffic is out of control. Cost of living is out of control. It's very difficult for working families, uh, families with children, families caring for kapuna. It's difficult for them to make a go of it here in Hawaii. And you know, we're seeing our young people move away and they don't come back. So you know. This situation, as horrible as it is, you know, really gives us an opportunity to look at what, what do we want Kauai to look like uh, after the pandemic? Because I know that right now, people are enjoying the, uh, the slower pace of life, the lack of traffic, the empty um, beaches. You know, people are feeling like they can breathe a little bit. Um, you know, we're not happy to be stuck at home. We're, we're all missing our friends and family and loved ones that live in other places. But this has given us a time to hit a pause button and say, you know, what do we like? What do we want this community to look like next year? And I, <clears throat> I liken it to what happened on the North Shore of Kauai in April of 2018 after the catastrophic flooding that happened up there and basically shut down that part of the island for a couple of years. And during that downtime, the community had the opportunity to come together and really have a great conversation about, okay, when, when it's time to reopen to the outside world, like literally when they fix the road so that people can actually get here again, what do we want this to look like? And they were able to create um, solutions, like actual solutions with the government um, as a partner in deciding, okay, we want we want less cars. We want the cars that come to be park here. We want X number of spaces to be held open for residents to be able to come and access these areas too. You know, and as a result of that conversation, um, that part of the island is a much more uh, peaceful place to visit. It's a much more beautiful place to visit. The residents there are much less uh, stressed by the overwhelming presence of uh, visitors. And you know now we get to to look at that on kind of a community wide island wide level, and um, you know it's 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 very rare that you get an opportunity um, to start over. I mean, not from scratch, but to really get back down to brass tacks and be able to say, all right, when when the planes start coming, how many? Uh, where do we want the visitors to go? How how is this going to work? How are we going to make sure that our residents? Um, are able to get jobs and to be able to have decent middle-class jobs where they can buy a house and raise kids and have a family and enjoy life, uh, enjoy the good things about life on Kauai because there are certainly many good things here to enjoy. You know, in a funny way, Kauai is a, it's like a laboratory for the rest of us. You know, it's a smaller island and smaller population, but we can see what happens there and maybe we can take some lessons from Kauai. I mean, one example, for example, would be KIUC, which has done so well in Kauai, uh, and we can all learn from uh, its uh, adventures and its, its progress. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about COVID in Kauai and how uh, the mayor, Derek Kawakami, has done, how people see him. Uh, there, are, there are people who think he's ready for higher office in this state. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Well, you know, the mayor uh, and his team really stepped up uh, when it became clear what the scope of this pandemic was going to be. Uh, I give a lot of credit to, to him, to our emergency management administrator, Elton Ushio, and his team who have been working, uh, you know, the word tirelessly gets thrown out a lot, but he, he and his team have been working beyond tirelessly. Uh, our police chief, Todd Raybuck, you know, everybody really got on board early in the process and said, we have to take this very seriously. And, you know, as a result, we, we went 10 weeks with no new cases here on the island. Now, we did have another cluster erupt over the next couple days, and it would not surprise me. It's fairly inevitable that there will be other cases here on our island, but people here are very resilient. They're very durable. They've been through uh, disasters before, whether it's natural disasters, Isn't that the truth? Yeah. floods, whatever it may be, people here understand the importance of um, doing what's right for the greater good, even if it's frustrating or uh, painful for us in the moment. 
Have you and had to prosecute anybody for failure to follow the rules? Uh, we've COVID? received um, dozens upon dozens of cases uh, of people being cited for, you know, we had a curfew at one point on the island uh, between, you know, the hours of 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. because it was very important um, to us at that time to make sure that people were staying home and not being out on the roads. Um, you know, we uh, attempted to enforce you know, a message during the day of make sure you're only traveling for essential purposes. Um, there were roving checkpoints across the island to um, discourage travel and they were very effective. Um, you know, and we have had uh, numerous people who were cited for uh, violating curfew, violating the rules against, you know, certain closures of park areas. And we've even had some fairly well publicized um, incidences of people violating uh, quarantine and we've charged them appropriately. Now we know that there was also a lot of confusion, particularly in the early part of this process where we had uh, emergency orders and rules, you know, changing on almost a daily basis. And, you know, we're not out here looking to hammer local residents who were confused about whether they could swim or walk on the beach or sit on the beach. You know, that's, that's not the kind of person we're, we're looking to hammer, but the people who willfully flouted uh, the quarantine and jeopardized our public safety, uh, particularly those who, um, had the gall to travel here from the mainland during this process. Um, you know, those people are going to face consequences for what they did. Mm. But, you know, we also recognize that, um, you know, sometimes people are confused about what the rules are and about what their obligations are. And, you know, we take each case on its own merits. Well, Justin, you presented a, a really uh, appealing picture about Kauai, and I'm, it's consistent with my appreciation of Kauai. My wife is from Kauai, so I'm a oh. little soft on Kauai in general. Um, but, you know, and but it's a big city environment also. You, you know, you spoke about the crime and the domestic uh, the violence and, uh, you know, the uh, drugs and so forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we, and we can't forget that it is part of the state and it is a community that, that, that does have people who, don't, who break the rules and who, who can't participate constructively in, in the community. And, and uh, that, that leads me to, to ask you, uh, you know, we, we have had a lot of problems with the prosecutor's office here in, um, in Honolulu. I mean, it has been a focus of public attention for a long time, scandalous and corrupt and what have you, uh, leading to federal prosecutions and the like. I'm really awful to think that our, you know, as you said before, prosecutors have a lot of power. Um, and uh, it's awful to think that the prosecutor's office uh, has gone off the side here in Oahu. And I wonder what your thoughts are about that and whether that kind of thing is, is somehow endemic uh, uh, and whether steps have to be taken to avoid it happening. Uh, how do you see that? Well, certainly. And, you know, uh, elections matter. Elections have consequences. And certainly what's happened in the Honolulu uh, prosecuting attorney's office and in the Honolulu Police Department in recent years has given a black eye to all of us in law enforcement, um, particularly those of us who try to do the job the right way. Um, you know, and Hawaii is going to have the same conversation that the rest of our country is having about policing, about uh, criminal justice, and about ways that we can make this system serve the community rather than injure the community. And uh, certainly what's happened in Honolulu um, I mean, it's, it's a, it illustrates a systemic failure, a failure of accountability at every single level, whether it's, um, you know, the police commission, uh, the, um, the, the mayor's office. I mean, it, it goes, you know, everyone has their, their, their role to play in this. And, you know, over the years in, in this country, we've created a system by design where it's very difficult for actors in the criminal justice system to be held accountable. Um, when you've got a problem in the chief's office at the Honolulu Police Department, like you did, um, and he's only accountable to a police commission, which is made up of lay members of the community who may not have any uh, particular training or experience in, in law enforcement or criminal justice or management, you know, it's very difficult for, for a system like that to function. And that's what happens when you create a system that uh, that that uh, 
avoids accountability and transparency. It's very, you know, it was historically very easy for many years for um, bad actors to be able to get away with that kind of conduct. I'm sure it still happens in a lot of places. And, um, you know, it's up to us who have the platform to advocate for change, to use that platform to advocate to make our systems better. And that's what I've been committed to doing on Kauai in my career. And, um, you know, hopefully uh, the citizens of Honolulu will choose wisely this November and, and you will see things continue to um, improve over there, hopefully. Yeah. And, you know, the whole notion of an independent judiciary and, and justice system, independent prosecutors has come up in the Jeffrey Berman issue in the Southern District of New York, uh, where clearly um, his independence has been undermined by um, the administration. Uh, and so I think it points out to all of us um, how important it is uh, that we have a prosecutor who is um, uh, independent, just as our judges need to be independent. So uh, our prosecutors should not be politicized by existing forces in, in the government or in politics. But let me ask you one last question. And this came sure. up in the context of the Leadership Institute, uh, in which your colleague there in Kauai, Mike Mo uh, Moskowitz, was involved. Um, and I think, uh, I, you know, it's, it's important that we all consider this. Uh, that is the role of, of lawyers and lawyer public officials uh, in enforcing, in preserving, in protecting the rule of law, especially in these difficult times when the rule of law seems to be under attack in so many ways. Can you speak about that? Do you have a particular thought about that? Sure. Uh, we had a legitimate constitutional crisis unfold in the Southern District of New York on Friday. Um, and for a few hours, it was um, it was very scary to contemplate the possible outcomes there. And certainly, that's um, something that has replicated itself in any number of situations over the last few years. Uh, to me, that's that's not a, a partisan issue, but it's 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 just the facts. And you know, one thing I'm grateful for is that in Hawaii we have. Um, institutions like the Hawaii State Bar Association who do things, who do programs like the Leadership Institute. I was part of the HSBA Second Leadership Institute back in 2011, along with a lot of people who have become lifetime friends, including uh, my, my good friend Becky Gardner, who's running for office now over there in Honolulu. Shout out to her. But um, it's up to us in professions like the law and professions like law enforcement to educate the community, educate the people who vote for us. Prosecutors have a massive amount of power in the criminal justice system. I would say we are the most powerful actors in the criminal justice system. We decide um, who is going to face charges in court. We determine what plea agreements are going to be offered. We determine what sentences we're going to be ask, asking for. You know, our, our mercy and compassion or lack thereof changes lives on a daily basis. And so, um, you know, it's, it's up to us to recognize that that, that power is um, something to take very seriously. And, you know, those of us in the profession who, who advocate for change um, have a lot of work to do in bringing along some actors in the system to kind of understand that you can do things a little bit differently and also make sure your community stays safe. So. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Justin Kohler, prosecuting attorney of Kauai. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. It's been my pleasure. Uh, call me again anytime. Aloha. Aloha.